Hello everyone, I'm Erin, also known as Breakfast Candy on Roblox, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to our Level Up Roundtable on Brands and Intellectual Property, featuring, de featuring developers from Toya, the Metaverse team, and the gang, as well as Roblox's own Game Insights game designer, Dan, aka DSPAV. Dan, take it away. Thanks, Erin, and hello everyone. Welcome back if you've joined us for Level Up before, and welcome if this is your first time. And thanks for joining us for another uh, episode of Level Up. Today, we're going to be talking about brand partnerships and ways that you can incorporate those into your games or create new games alongside brands. Uh, we're joined by three very talented development teams today, and I'm going to go through one by one and introduce them, starting with Guy, who's representing Toya. Guy, how are you doing today? Hello. Hi, good morning, good evening. And <laughs> yes. Hi, uh, I'm Guy, I'm from Toya. Um, Toya is a female-led, female-funded game studio on Roblox. Um, we've, we've developed a game last year with Miraculous, with Zag Entertainment, which have uh, the series and the movies for Miraculous Ladybug. Um, Toya is a, uh, is a studio, um, that is focused on creating non-stereotypical games and promoting um, promoting the well the, the 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 option for female game developers and and female game designers uh, as something that is like a big part of the industry. Uh, we usually see uh, whoo, we usually see less uh, than what we have. Like in Toya, we have seventy percent female developers and female game designers. So we are really hoping to show by example that there's a place for for game developers and game designers of all of all <laughs> um and yeah i'm guy i'm the uh, product manager vp product for toya um when i started two and a half years ago we were five people we're like 21 now we're supposed to be 40 people by the end of this year um before toya i was working on free-to-play games and i've been working with uh, a few brands. I was working with Barca and Arsenal FC football clubs and was uh, the product manager for Bubble Shooter, which is a big game on mobile and PC. So hello, nice to meet you. Welcome, Guy. Uh, we're glad to have you here. Uh, moving on to our next team, we have the Metaverse team that's joining us today uh, with Ben. Ben, how are you doing today? Good. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, so I'm Ben. I've, I've been in uh, game development and software development for over a decade. Um, in the early days of mobile, worked at Kabam on Kingdoms of Camelot, which was the top grossing app uh, back then in 2012. And at Kabam, also managed production teams on Hobbit, uh, Kingdoms of Middle Earth. So that was another uh, licensed brand product from Tolkien and WB, and uh, gained some experience working with brands and licensing there. And then since then, worked with other uh, top free to play publishers uh, at Elex. Um, we licensed uh, Call of Duty and then also uh, worked with Supercell for a number of years. And then in 2020, I got uh, really excited about the value proposition for developers on Roblox. And so signed on some brands and then started working with, with the gang, actually. So shout out to them on this call. Um, and we together started working on Nerf Strike and uh, more recently on, on Angry Birds. And uh, now Metaverse team, we have a, a team growing as well and have some great games in the pipeline including some with brands. Well, thanks, Ben, and welcome. Uh, we're excited to talk to you about brand partnerships today. You know, you kind of stole my thunder here, but we do have another team that has joined us today. Uh, the gang, the gang, welcome. We have Ollie and Hawken joining us. How are you guys doing today? Doing really good, thank you. Great to be here. It's great to have you. Hawken, how are you doing? Very well, thank you for having us. Yeah, absolutely. Could you tell us a little bit about, you know, the gang? Like, what are some of the projects you've worked on? Like, what are you doing here on Roblox? Absolutely. So um, we uh, founded uh, the gang a bit over two years ago. It was me, Ulle, and three other founders. For that, just as the other uh, panelists here, uh, we spent uh, over 10 years in the games industry making mobile games, PC games for Steam and whatnot, Xbox, etc. Uh, we have a we have previous experience working with IPs as well. Um, so that experience uh, we have uh, before we joined the platform. Um, so um, starting the gang a bit over two years ago, we've grown it to we are over sixty people now. 
And uh, just as the other teams, we have a very diverse team with uh, well-educated uh, game developers, uh, both male and female representation in, in, in all uh, disciplines. Uh, we have multiple nationalities and cultures, and we have a nice wide uh, age spread, like 19 to 50. So yeah, we've, uh, we're really proud over the team that we've created uh, uh, for the short amount of time that we've been on the platform. I mean, it's just a bit over two years, but yeah, right. it's, it's been one age of a ride. Yeah. I mean, that's no small feat. I mean, a lot of developers that we work with, typically the size you see is maybe like two to five people. So 60, I know they're working on different projects, but yeah, congratulations. That's, that's really awesome that you guys have gotten there. Um, well, we wanted to hop into the topic now that we've introduced our panel. And I think I'll start with Hawken and Ollie. Uh, we're going to hop into, first of all, what does it mean to partner with a brand? What is a brand partnership? If you guys were to give a definition. I, I think to us, the, like the importance of partnering with a brand is trying to find uh, something that fits on the platform. Um, a lot of the work that we are putting into the brands has come from our own internal products because when uh, we came from a background, we had like a combined experience of 50 plus years of something in the industry. And we thought we were gonna just smash this platform. This is gonna be easy. But we saw pretty fast that as Ben said, it's, I mean, the learning curve on this platform is pretty steep. It's very different. Um, so we started off with a brand partnership. The first thing we did uh, when we created a game called Lumberjack Legends. Mm -hmm. um, it didn't come out great at first. We redid it, and uh, with that knowledge, we could build uh, our own internal titles. So we pushed out a couple of them. We are trying out different genres and building our knowledge and also applying that knowledge to every brand partnership that comes in and trying to identify, like, what about your brand uh, fits on the platform? And mm. how can we implement it in a nice way? Mm. I guess maybe to clarify, when we talk about brand partnerships, um, Ali, are we talking about, you know, having a game that's existing and incorporating that IP into it? Or are you talking about like starting a project fresh with that, that team? Um, uh, from our perspective. Yeah, from our perspective, it's starting a project completely fresh. So mm. everything from the conception of where we uh, get an idea or where we pitch an idea and how we together with the client develop a product that we think uh, will fit for the platform. Mm. Okay. So Guy, I guess I'm going to call on you for this. In, in your case, right, your team Toya sits down and decides we want to make a game. You partnered with Miraculous and then you started to build a Miraculous specific game, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. And it's... Um... I think also we talked with the community, we talked with our Discord channel. We, the same as like Ali said, we, for the last two years, we had this experience of like taking the knowledge that we had from other platforms and also like having young new developers joining in and trying to understand how everything connects together. So, um, but in, so it was like this learning curve of like understanding how, how it works. And into that, we added like, the Roblox community, so making sure to talk to them and understand what brands they feel should be on the platform, and mm -hmm. to put our, our ourselves in their shoes and like what would they want to see on the on the experience. So yeah, mm -hmm. and connecting that with the knowledge that we're researching. So. Mm -hmm. Would you identify just like given your experience uh, working on different projects, like is there a difference for you in developing a brand focused like experience versus maybe your own creative experience, like? Yeah, I, I think the initial question of like, what would the player want to experience is like mm. right there because you want to jump in like the metaverse is about jumping into a world and becoming a part of something. Uh, if you're jumping into a brand, you, you already know or have some understanding of what you want to be. So that has to be really connected with the experience. Of, mm, mm. So, so players are coming in with some expectations versus... See? Exactly. You know, your yeah. own idea, like they don't really know what to expect in, until they get in there. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, Ben, I, I want to throw this one over to you because, you know, you were in your introduction just rattling off all these different partnerships you've done. Like, what are the benefits of working with a brand versus just starting out fresh on like a new IP? Like, why would yeah. you go for that, that route? So when I think about licensing, when you're starting out on a new project that might be an intellectual property project, what we call IP projects, um, in licensing, you're borrowing or renting really the awareness and affinity that a brand has built over decades. Mm. Uh, sometimes, in most cases, honestly, it's spent millions and millions of dollars building that brand, both in production of you know maybe movies or uh, product, and then also in marketing. Um, so they've built this enormous brand, and then you come in and you say, "Hey, it looks like." the brand that you've built is a good match in terms of awareness and affinity. And when I say affinity, that's sort of the percentage of people who in a survey would say that they like uh, the brand uh, and in a specific demo. So like on Roblox, that the Roblox user base is a good match for uh, the age group and uh, gender split of the intellectual property that you're considering licensing. And then I think the, the shocking thing for people when they first start working with brands is just to see that these IP holders who spent millions of dollars building these brands are pretty precious about how they're going to be used <laughs> and have a lot of opinions about it. Um, and so I think that that is probably the steepest learning curve for developers who have built their own intellectual properties and games to begin with, where they can be kind of loosey goosey about the direction it's heading in and how development is happening. And then when you start working with a brand and they say, well, no, we want to see everything that you're planning on doing. Uh, especially for the more uh, established brands before you put anything out and we want to see every asset that's going in the game and every design document, we want it all spelled out in detail. And mm -hmm. so that I think is uh, for a lot of people starting out with brands, that's going to be one of the tougher spots. Mm. Do you think that's like a hard rule is, is like everyone reading every single sentence of every single thing that you do and, and demanding that they give approval or does it like depend on the IP that that you're working on and the person you're it partnering with. Totally depends on the IP. If you're working with one, so I would say like for Hobbit, for example, right? The Lord of the Rings or Hobbit, that was a brand that's done a lot of intellectual property licensing. So they're very yeah. familiar with it. They have software systems designed specifically for reviewing every asset that <laughs> you want to put in the game. They've got a team of people who's focused on reading every document that you send their way. And in your contract, you usually even have a review period. So like everything we send to you, we need feedback on in seven days, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can work with intellectual property holders who might just be uh, you know, an individual game maker who built their own IP. And they might not have as, many, you know, as much staff or as many rules around how that IP can be used. So I think it can vary a lot, but when you're talking about the big boys, the, you know, the very established brands, uh, they, they're going to be pretty uh, process oriented around reviews and uh, building the game. Okay. All right. Well, Hawken, I wanted to throw this over to you based on everything that Ben just said, sounds like, you know, when you go for a brand partnership, uh, you know, and I get this a lot from developers, does that mean that creativity is dead? You're not allowed to do anything creative. You have to do really boring stuff. Uh, you know, you have to let the IP holder dictated, or is there sort of room for, you know, creativity and the IP work that you're doing? Yeah, totally. I mean, uh, uh, going back to the uh, original uh, discussion that we had about like joining the platform and relearning, like uh, it's, it's the same thing here. You're not only designing something for yourself that you want to play yourself. You're actually designing it for a target audience. And in this case, also for a brand. So mm -hmm. it needs to tap into all of these buckets. So you need to like the product that you are designing and producing. The player base needs to like it and the IP and the, the brand needs to uh, like the product as well. So uh, there, it's this trinity of, of, of uh, uh, expectations that you need to, to, to design and produce for. Mm. So it's kind of just like one more element that's added to the creative process. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, it it can it it could either be super super positive where you get a lot of positive feedback and and ideas that you might not come up with because you you are not super super into the brand of. I don't know, sparkling water or whatnot, uh, or it could be the other way around. They have very, very specific uh, uh, requests, which could be hard to shoehorn into a product or a game that you think would fit the Roblox audience. So it's this uh, line dancing between uh, 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 all these uh, different elements. So the, the, the client or the IP, the brand and the player base and you as a, a game developer. 
Mm. Mm. Well, I guess on that thread, you know, Hawken, for you and, and your team, the gang, like what are some of your goals and priorities when you're, you're partnering or you're trying to choose like a, a brand partnership? Uh, what are some of the things that you consider? Yeah, I would say, first of all, we really feel that it needs to fit the, the platform or that we have a clear vision for how we can bring that, that partner to, to, to the platform. Uh, super clear example there is the Vans. Uh, for us, there was a no-brainer. It's going to be a skateboard game. Like, mm-hmm. you, can't, you can't tell us otherwise. Uh, uh, so, so, and yeah, I think we pretty much succeeded there. We, 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 we took the brand, uh, we, we uh, embodied what it should be, and we built a really good game. So, so that's a super clear one-to-one. Like we mm. knew immediately that this is going to be a skateboard game. Mm. So when, when you're reaching out to a brand, you already have established what your goals are, and you're trying to also meet those in addition to the brands, correct? I, I mean, no, it's different between uh, uh, different brands. So some brands might already know what they want to do. Some brands might don't. They, they might not have a clue. Like we don't know what we want to do. So okay. they, they more they more or less reach out and, and ask us like, uh, what should we do? Uh, mm. So yeah, a, a brand partnership comes in all constellations in uh, di- with different uh, um, um, information and uh, requests. Right. So it's more of like a box of chocolates kind of scenario where you never exactly. know what you're going to get. Okay. Exactly. Well, Guy, I wanted to throw it over to you, you know, as, as the product owner of Toya, like, what are some of your goals and priorities that you try and think about when you're going into a, a potential partnership with the brand? Um, it's, it's, um, it's really about like having this conversation with the brand itself and also understanding what's their goals. Mm-hmm. So when, we, when we're releasing a game and we're, we're, th- we're thinking about like the audience, we're also thinking about like what they want to see and you know what they want to see is like a genre of a game, but then you have to also understand what the brand wants to see on Roblox or what's their goals. Like if, if you have a conversation with the representative, with the owners of the brand and they should have like this kind of like general goal of what they want to see coming out of this partnership um, in, in like in relations to like um, all that was said just before this um, about like protecting the brand or having like very strong definitions about the brand, we created a role play game. And a big part of the role play game is making sure you represent yourself and have the avatar editor and, and really creating your own character. So in our discussions, they had like, they had like this shock moment or like this scare moment where they're like, they can't create like a B superhero with like a ladybug powers. And we're like, no, no, they don't. It's like there's no such there's no such IP. You know, we have like these 13 characters or these 20 characters, and that's how they look, and that's their style guide. They're like, yeah, but a role play game is so you have to have like this discussion, and you have to have someone that's like, first of all, know what they want out of the experience, and that was like also explaining to them that, um, you know, and, and hope that they understand it, which they did which is like a role play experience or this like experience would give the players to become a part of the series. And that's creating their own superhero and see how that can work with the brand. So. Mm. Well, that's a really, yeah, that's a really interesting point. And I guess it leads me to the question for you guys, like how do you strike a balance between the wants and needs of the brand and the wants and needs of your studio, right? In order to maintain a business, Mm -hmm. you know, maintain a successful project? Like how do you find a balance between the two? Um, It's really about like making sure it's, well, it's first of all, like about having like this discussions and this talks and making sure that the brand side is is a part of, you know, this brainstorm or what's happening. And I think like one of the more like important parts is to have like this missions or like this objective of like, what do we count as like a success for the game? Uh, from both sides because mm-hmm. um, otherwise we could have like we we were laughing about it we can print a shirt that that says like what do you do in this game because we kept getting like asked that a lot about role play it was like it's it's about role play um, <laughs> so explaining that to a brand you have to know like what's their goal so you can also like say all right so this is what's gonna this is like the end happening or like this is what's going to happen in a session so communication yeah yeah 
Ben, can you riff on that as well? I know that you've, you've worked with a lot of partners at this point. Like what does that communication process look for you or how do you sort of establish your sort of line or your goals as a company and properly communicate that to the brands that you're going to work with? Yeah, so usually it starts out with us identifying a brand that we're excited about working with because, uh, you know, there's a good overlap, we think, with the demographics on a given platform. Mm -hmm. We'll go to them and say, hey, would you potentially be interested in doing something on Roblox? And then uh, they'll, if they say yes, then we'll come up with more of a fleshed out pitch of like, here's what that game might look like. Here's the kind of team that would work on it. Here's the timeline, stuff like that. <clears throat> and then um, after that point, you know, just sort of iterating on it and uh, communicating regularly with the IP holders so that they know the direction that you're headed in and why you're headed in that direction. Uh, just having open lines of communication. Mm. Just communication is I, I, that's what I'm hearing repeated here over and over is you have to be able to communicate. Don't let them run you over, but also don't try and run over them. You know, it's a part, it's called a brand partnership for a reason, right? <laughs> All right. Well, great. I think we're going to pause there. And then Ben, I wanted to return to you and dive into process afterwards, but you know, I, let's toss this back over to Aaron real quick. Aaron, do we have any questions? We do. We have some great questions. First one, how does one get in contact with brands? For someone like me who has never really tried, it looks like something that's very hard to get into. Call Dan and Aaron anytime, day or night. They'll pick up, get you in touch with the brands. That's not, that's not true. <laughs> Um, if I if I could hop in here, maybe my from what I've seen from developers, just based off of what Ben said, what I what I've seen developers do is sometimes it's okay to just reach out, you know, to these brands, try and, and contact maybe like a PR department or something like that, and say, hey, we're a development team on Roblox. Here are some of the interesting projects we worked on before. Definitely helps to show a track record of you know some projects and some familiarity with the platform, and then following that, you know trying to start a relationship there and showing them maybe potentially what it could look like for their brand to be on the platform. Um, you know, I'll toss it over to our panel though. That's why they're here. Is that generally what the pro the process has looked like for y'all as well? Um, yeah, I think uh, communicating with the licensing departments. Um, you get your, uh, another tip is a lot of these folks, the licensing teams of most big brands do the conference circuits. So they're at every, you know, this is not an easy thing, but it's not, it's not really, I, I think it is something that it takes time to sort of build up the network in that space. Uh, you can start with one brand and as you, you know, grow your portfolio, you'll be more attractive to other brands as a potential partner, but uh, at major conferences uh, in gaming, a lot of the licensing folks for top brands will be there and you can always try sort of pinging them on LinkedIn and see if they'll be interested in meeting. Yeah, I think it's a, I think Ben is making a good point. Like, it's a lot of hard work, a lot of pitching going on. If you have a great idea, just keep shooting them out. If you find you're in, it's going to get easier and easier. Um, yeah, just keep building your portfolio and also keep building great uh, games on the platform for yourself. Build that knowledge of different genres um, and everything. All right, thank you, everybody. Uh, let's see, next we have, how did each studio get involved with brand partnerships? So how did all of you get started? Um, for, us, for, for us, it was always uh, a part of the roadmap. We wanted, to, we wanted to create our own games and our own prototypes and really like, we were in, in a, we were structuring like the studio and a part of that was getting the experience and getting the experience was like, you know, making as many different games and prototypes as we can to also like introduce developers who have been only working on other platforms to Roblox. Um, so it was like always channels that were working in parallel. Uh, we've been talking to, I think, tons, tons of, tons of, 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 you know, different IPs and uh, and brands. So it was always a part of the, of our plan. And from from our end, uh, I think Ulla touched upon it in the beginning. Our first our first game on the platform was a brand partnership. So that was actually how we got onto the platform. Uh, but also to 
yeah, to chime in on that thing as well. We we had a lot of experience uh, with this from other industries as well. We had done a lot of partnerships and we had built uh, a network from before that we could use as well coming into the platform. Awesome. All right. Well, Guy, you touched on this one a bit, but how do you explain Roblox to a brand that wants to create an experience and manage their expectations? Well, um, you set up a meeting and you help them create the Roblox account. And then you, you know, explain to them how, how do you jump into an experience with, with me? It's not, no, 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 press, press here. Um, and then you just like have this like half an hour of like taking, you know, like people like from licensing or from a brand into an experience in Roblox. And, and um, sometimes it has to have like a lot of trust, which like having a portfolio and, you know, having experience on, on this platform or different platform in the past on mobile um, to, to make sure that you can translate that. But it's really about like um, being like the kind of like the, 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 the guide for like Roblox and, and really like explaining what is happening here and also like trying to get to like this user segmentation or trying to like break it into like something that is a bit more like technical to what is a user on Roblox and what is a game on Roblox and what is the difference between that and other entertaining entertainment products. Um, so it's, yeah, it's gonna be communication again. But uh, yeah, it's about like playing together with them on Roblox and really introducing Roblox to them. Awesome, all right. With the additional level of approvals required to work with an IP holder, does the production cycle take longer to launch a branded game? Um, usually, I would say, um, because of, uh, about the communication again, um, it's a lot more lead times uh, that you might not be used to in your own internal where you can just keep like full steam ahead. Uh, you might want to move a bit more cautiously uh, when you work with a brand partnerships or you're probably going to have to. Yeah, you might also be comfortable with a certain level of polish for like a beta version of the game that you want to get out there to players, but the brand may not be right because they might have much higher you know, standards about exactly what they're willing to put out there with their brand name on it. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. That makes a lot of sense. And that is all the time we have for questions now. So Dan, back to you. All right, thanks Aaron. And thanks everyone for the great questions. You uh, actually did my job there because you asked one of my questions for me. So Ben, I wanted to bring it back to you and hop back in. And I know that each of us have discussed this already, but maybe definitively, could you sort of outline some very important keys in terms of how do you know whether a brand is right for your game or how do you know that it's right for your team to be working with a brand? Like what factors should our developers be considering when weighing a partnership? I'll do my best to do it definitively. Uh, I, I think uh, the... Uh, a couple of considerations that folks have already brought up on the panel, but I think are really important. One is match for the demographics. So like, does the age range match uh, what's popular for that intellectual property? And does the age, uh, the gender split also make sense there? You'll, you know, you'll notice that some IPs skew really heavily male or skew really heavily female. And then you can consider whether the type of game and the genre that you want to build using that intellectual property also tends to skew the same direction in terms of age and gender so that you can make sure that the game design and the intellectual property are a good match for each other uh, and what you want to build. And then that your team is interested in building that, because I think we all know the team's not interested in building it. It's just a lot more challenging to build a great game. What? You mean working on a project that you hate wouldn't be fun? No way. <laughs> well, Hawk and Ollie, the gang, I wanted to throw it over to you. Um, does that sort of resonate with you? Or are those a lot of the things that you sort of consider when you're working with a, a brand? Absolutely, that is, uh, that, that's a, a super good answer. So I wanted to hop into this uh, in terms of the process, like you've selected the brand that you want to partner with um, and you're in the process of forging a partnership with them. Like generally, what does that process look like? Is there any sort of legal advice you need to sort of take? 
um, you know, what goes into sort of estimating how long the project's going to take, you know, how many resources you're going to need. Like, can you sort of walk us through that, that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So in some some cases, it's pretty easy to point towards uh, maybe existing products or uh, uh, or ideas, and uh, and uh, and um, base your um, uh, clients' expectations on that. So, for example, you can point on um, let's take Strongman Simulator as an example, and then say like we could do a game like this. It would probably take this and this amount of time. But for us, uh, like it's been said multiple times in 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 this uh, session but it's very important to have that uh, dialogue with the with the client it's 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 you need to go back and forth and you need to bounce uh, the risks uh, with doing uh, something in one way and uh, the risk of doing it in another way and what is it bringing to the to the platform uh, what's the risk of doing this or what's the risk of doing that so uh, Communication back and forth with the with the clients or the brands all the time. That's 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 super super important. You can also um, chime in a bit uh, again on like the the value of doing your research and especially on this platform where you have such a wide range of genres. So the more genres you try out, uh, the more systems you try to build, the more knowledge you build on how long does this take? Like what kind of lead times will we need for this and that feature? And that can give you more like confidence in making a correct estimate and hitting a really good and polished product on release date. Mm. So I guess on that same thread, and I'll open this up to anybody in the panel who wants to, to try and answer it. Like, you know, when you're, you're talking with a brand and you're sort of sealing the deal how do you even begin to think about funding? Like, how do you even begin to think about, you know, how much money you need for your team to be successful? Um, how do you sort of predict how long the project's going to take? Like, are there some high level pointers without going too nitty gritty into any details? Um, like high level pointers that developers can take away in terms of things to consider. Um, I think, when you're when planning the pipeline or like when planning the development process, you have to just make sure you take into consideration the revisions. You have to take into consideration the version uh, approval. You know, windows like uh, we work in sprints, so we create a version like every two weeks. So making sure that we add that additional buffer, and we discovered like from. From experience, uh, that like less than three to five days of like, uh, and less than two revisions might like get us into like trouble. So, um, so it's just about like calculating in advance this extra buffer that, um, yeah, so somewhere there. Okay, there there are a couple of quirks that you'll run into too when you start talking to IP people and brand people. Um, so one thing that's sort of interesting, I think to note is just to think about the motivations of the team that's selling you a brand. Uh, usually their core and only KPI is how much money they can bring in in a given year. And they know that games are a risky business. So a lot of times what they'll try and present you with is a minimum guarantee, what they'll call an MG, which is an upfront cash payment. Um, you can use your best judgment on whether that's a good idea or not. I think, uh, Generally speaking, it's um, a lot of risk for you and not a lot of risk for them. So it's something to consider carefully. And then the other funny thing that comes up a lot is that these, a lot of these IP representatives uh, have this long list of intellectual property, only probably, you know, maybe they have a hundred different titles and probably only about five that anybody is interested in. So you'll go into a meeting and you'll say like, you want something on the level of, you know, like Marvel, Star Wars, you know, minions or whatever. And they'll say, how about, you know what the kids are really into these days? Dirty dancing. I think that would be a great IP for you guys to build a game with. Uh, because, you know, the, the directive from their manager is like, you guys have to sell, uh, you know, all these intellectual properties that are way down the list that nobody else is interested in. So I think that's the other thing is just, you know, keeping your wits about you in these meetings to be sure that um, the intellectual properties that you're, you end up pitching for 
are RIPs that are really interesting to you and that are a good fit for the audience? I mean, you can speak for yourself there. I would love personally to see Patrick Swayze on Roblox. So I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Sounds like a good idea for like a game on Roblox. Thank yeah, <laughs> dirty, dirty dancing <laughs> game. Somebody get on this right away. No. Um, cool. Well, I wanted to move on in the process here, right? So we've sealed the deal. We're starting development. Where do you even begin with initial concept? Um, ben, you know, you're kind of on a roll here. So I want to throw this one to you. Like, how does the initial concepting phase begin with the team? Um, and Guy, maybe as well, I want to throw it over to you because you were talking about, you know, getting them into Roblox, showing them what games look like and sort of pitching your ideas. But for both of you, like, what does that initial concept phase look like? Yeah, I think what we often do is we'll just benchmark on what is uh, taking a look at what is successful on the platform, what's working on Roblox. And then you look at are any of the genres that are successful on Roblox a, uh, a good fit for uh, the intellectual property that you're interested in. And that's a really good way to convince brands that it might be a good idea to build that type of game. Hmm. Guy, for you as well, like maybe I'll go into detail on that. That's very interesting, Ben. But Guy, for you, like, with, with Miraculous as an example, how did you ultimately determine what style of game would be a right fit for that IP? Um, I think that for us, it connected, first of all, it connected with Toya and the fact that Miraculous is, uh, you know, is a female superhero and it's focused on, uh, uh, on the younger audience um, than, you know, other superheroes. Um, and it felt very natural that role play uh, is, is where we want to take it and like creating this experience because we were all sitting and thinking like when we were like fans of like super characters when we were young, we wanted to role play as those characters and, you know, modify whatever we can in the environment. So it felt really natural. That was actually like the, the hardest part because then we have to, to explain this uh, behavior and not something which has like a more you know, a normal gameplay loop of, of, of some, you know, getting scores and levels and, and, and experience points. So, um, but I think that we all felt that this is where we want to take it. And we didn't only trust ourselves, we went with the community. We did like a few play tests. We went and played with our, uh, uh, with our community, other role play games and asked them about superheroes. Mm. And recorded all of that and showed that to the brand. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. Let's dive into that a little bit, the iteration process. Um, Hawken and Ollie, for you, right, you took one look at Vans and you were like, this needs to be a skateboard game. How do you kind of like validate that once you start to put that into motion in terms of like getting it in front of your audience and sort of testing that theory? Mm -hmm. I think in, in that case, we wanted to establish establish like a core loop very, very fast and just get a feel of it because that was the uh, that was the main thing of the game that that has to be good. So we really had to work on that. And I think that goes a little bit for all brands that you work on. You have to you have to kind of see what's the what's the goal for the product. Um, in this case, it was a lot about like, uh, as, but as you can see, the the experience is still up and is still running, uh, and they wanted to have this persistent thing. Um, so, so we really had to the core loop had to be tight because otherwise there would be nothing um, yeah. to come back to. But that can also depend on the brand partnership. That you work on is it a one-off kind of thing is it a persistent thing is revenue in mind is which kpis are in mind and those are all the things that you have to think about in the concept phase as well okay and so you start to build this project out right and obviously the brand has expectations for this like what generally has the approval process looked like for you ali um when it comes to design, we have to like uh, designing actual graphical assets. We of course have to like follow brand guidelines. We have to establish that really quickly, and uh, mm -hmm. um, and then it depends on 
how does certain brand partnerships work. Sometimes you go through a creative agency, sometimes you might go directly to the client, uh, and it can all depend. The approval process can be, it can be painful or it can be really simple. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> anybody else have that painful experience or maybe ways to sort of navigate through that painful experience? Guy, I see you sort of nodding your head while wincing. So I'm going to pick on you here. Oh, um, this is, um, I think really like it's like the advice itself sounds a bit harsh, but it's like, make sure that it's detailed in the agreement, but it's actually like one of the best um, advices because you don't want to get in low into a, a, you know, a discussion about what is and what is not with the brand that you're working with. So the more that it's detailed on like, um, if it's like UI elements or some effects, it's okay to like have like a revision or something. But if it's like specifically an IP logo of like some element or a specific element, which is, you know, a model, uh, then it has to be approved and like to get into a bit more detail or like actually as much detail as possible. will just like help the communication become more positive. Mm. Okay. All right, so we get to launching and marketing. And uh, Aaron, I'm going to call on you for this. I believe we have a few trailers here. Uh, but my question to the panel would be like, how does launching and marketing a branded game or tie-in experience differ from a non-branded experience? Uh, ben, maybe I'll, I'll pick on you this time for this one. Yeah, you know, one of the key advantages of leveraging a brand is that it traditionally lowers acquisition costs. Mm. Uh, for bringing new players into a game it's you know not necessarily as helpful for retention the game still has to be fun and feel authentic to the brand but you're more likely to get trial and uh and users to try out a game um when you have you have a brand that they already have affinity for you know if you like marvel movies you might try a marvel game but if it doesn't feel good to you once you're in there you're probably not going to stick around so okay well i see we have a trailer here for angry birds bird island uh, could you walk us through maybe like what was the marketing process here and, and ultimately how you landed on this? Yeah, so this is one that I, I worked on with the gang as well. So Hawk and, and Ula can talk about it uh, as well. But uh, in this particular case, we were working closely with the Rovio team. And so they actually, their marketing team was able to uh, be pretty closely involved in creating these branded assets. Great. Well, Aaron, can we play and show everyone what this is about? Hey, Stella, I'm outside your house. Come check out my new car. All right, I'm coming out. There you are. Pretty cool wheels, huh? I'll race you to the beach. You're on. Hey, <laughs> no slingshots. That is cheating. Are you little? Oh, but that's great. Um, so what was the reception to that? Did you guys get a lot of hype built around uh, Angry Birds making its way over to Roblox? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, to, to, to add to that, like Rovio has a big team, supportive team, and they have their own marketing team. And uh, um, so, so it's also, it can differ a lot between what company or brand you're working with. So if you're working with a smaller brand who doesn't have that or not usually work within with digital products, for example, then making a trader could be uh, a whole nother thing than doing it with a company that are used to doing that and also used to doing or making games. So yeah, that can differ a lot uh, mm. between different companies as well. Mm. And Ben touched on this, but I wanted to, to ask you as well, Hawken. So you know, he had mentioned user acquisition and, and the differences between your own IP and a branded IP. Have you, in your experience, because you, you've had so many of, the, of these under your belt, like what does that actually mean? And, and why is that a, such a big advantage for a brand partnership? I think uh, for ex with these examples, 
you already have a following. So the IP and the brand already have a following, uh, which are on other channels. So they might be on a YouTube channel. They might be on TikTok or Snapchat, uh, Instagram, whatnot. So per, they will automatically give you more exposure uh, wh when you're collaborating with, with brands that has ha have this following. Uh, that would be the big difference. So creating your own IP or working with an IP that might not be a big IP or a big brand, uh, it's not going to give you the initial um, um, uh, push that you could get from a, having a brand uh, which has a big following. Mm. So in the case of Nerf Strike here, the difference between having just a generic shooter and having it branded as Nerf, right? Your players automatically recognize that because they probably have a Nerf gun somewhere over in the corner of the room, you know, and that's something that they're excited to play with, right? Most likely. And <laughs> working working with a Nerf game, you will also meet uh, the super dedicated Nerf uh, uh, following, which is out there. Uh, yeah. Well, awesome. Well, before we, we show this clip here, could you briefly introduce us to Nerf Strike? Like, what is Nerf Strike for those in the audience who haven't played? Sure, absolutely. So uh, Nerf Strike is a, a first-person shooter um, uh, on Roblox. Uh, it contains a couple of different levels, uh, very playful built. Um, one of the games that I think pushed the visual uh, look on the platform. Uh, but you can correct me there if I'm wrong. But I think uh, Nerf Strike was one of the earlier games to try to push the, the graphical fidelity. It's definitely higher fidelity. I mean, it's a beautiful game. I've, I've played it myself. And uh, yeah, I mean, well, I, I'll, I'll stop talking. I'll let the trailer speak for itself. Aaron, can we share this? Yeah, wow. Great. I see that there's like a variety of, of different weapons there. Are those based off of real Nerf guns, each one of them? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So uh, as we mentioned um, previously, like working close together with IPs, you do you do get the luxury of representing the uh, real life products uh, and designs. So, yeah. mm -hmm. so did they just give you like a list of different like guns that or blasters that they wanted to see in game and you guys just handed them over to your art team to sort of model and, and recreate we we i mean it was in discussion so we were we were bouncing back and forth like what do we believe would be the best uh, uh, blasters on the platform and what uh, do the client or the ip want to see on the platform um so yeah, and I mean, uh, Nerf uh, Nerf has done a lot of collaborations with other uh, IPs or gaming platforms as well. So they they are uh, uh, an IP that has experience uh, uh, with licensing their their IP. I can tell you that a load of time got into like trying to figure out how to actually get all the details in these guns <laughs> in a performant way because there are a lot of small like bolts and screws and stuff. Yeah. So I imagine the approval process on there, right? You'd model it, go back to them, get it approved, tweak it a yeah. bit, go back to them, get it approved. Right, right. Okay. And to, well, add, and, and to add to that, to make it even more tedious for ourselves, we actually did each and every part could be reskinned with different skins. So just to make it even more uh, painful for ourselves. So you guys I'd really wanted to make it difficult for yourselves, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, but, it, but this was a super, super nice project. I mean, uh, yeah, we really love this game. It's, uh, yeah, we really love it. Well, that's great. 
Um, well, Guy, I wanted to toss it over to you. Aaron, do we have anything to share from Miraculous? No, oh, here we are. Yep. So Guy, for you, what was it like trying to recreate Miraculous in Roblox? So exactly, exactly the, the difference between like this picture and the next picture, which is like taking this, yeah, taking taking the style of the TV series and making sure that it fits Roblox and it fits the, you know, avatar editor and like making sure that you can customize everything. And <clears throat> it was a process. It was a, process, a, a, a big process with our art director and also um, the approval, you know, cycle and going back and forth and, and you know, um, making sure that everybody's happy with the results and with the resolution. If you see on like, the previous pictures there's um yeah there's they have a lot of like material concepts that like we had to adjust and these were a part of the brand so these do not exist in roblox or need to be like created in a way that fits um customization um mm -hmm. i think that what was really important for us because of all these issues was uh to make sure that the fans of the series like the change and they can connect with that um that they don't feel like we took something that they love and turned it into a language that they don't understand so talking to them and making sure that the brand you know is a part of, of this conversation was like very important to make sure that they know that the audience accept this and a, a lot about like uh, Roblox is also like understanding like that they that there's a specific visual language there's a different visual language to Roblox mm. so and, and you know Roblox users know that Roblox players know that the brand doesn't know that mm. so um, but I think uh, I think we did a really good job in like combining with them uh, with the styles and and translating the game into Roblox um, were they so, were they receptive to that upfront? Right, you're saying clearly there's a difference in visuals well, here. Were they were it, they receptive to that, or if not, like what did that conversation look like? <laughs> um, there were <laughs> there were three designs on the table. There were like different. We were doing like a few a few different sketches. Um, everybody were like very positive, and we all we all had this image in our head that this is the style that we're gonna have that we're gonna translate the brand into Roblox. Um, the brand itself wasn't like 100% uh, sure on that. So we had this process, but it was there in the beginning of the agreement as well. That's like part of like talking about like, uh, uh, you know, approval. So from 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 the beginning, we were like, our direction was like in the, in the agreement, discussions about like, if this translates well, what were a part of, of, of the legal talks, like, Okay. Well, I wanted to toss this over to you as well, Guy, uh, and then Ben, uh, maybe you, you follow up on this, but you launch Miraculous, right? Yeah. You kind of just like wipe the sweat off your brow and you're done and you move on to the next thing. Or like, what does long-term support for something like Miraculous look like? Um, we, we update the game weekly with new characters, new content, new mini games. Um, so we, uh, we'll be celebrating a year uh, next month. Um, and we've been working with the brand uh, on, on a weekly basis, even like almost on a daily basis. Uh, we make sure that all the assets are approved and, and the roadmap is approved by both of us. We have shared documents and we have uh, between one to two sync, sync sessions every week of like, getting into the game or just at least having a discussion with like all the images and, and all the documents in front of in front of us on on zoom um so we're working together we're we're planning also like a yearly roadmap and we approve that uh, i think it, it changes almost every quarter depending on like you know new things that are releasing for the for the series and like new new characters that we have now the world world war world wide right to release mm -hmm. um so we are on like weekly communication we have like new best friends uh in zag and <laughs> we also had like we also had like a few like uh 
just you know like just a just some events for fun like late night like um play together and and you know just like fun stuff virtually because you know covid and stuff but um yeah okay then for you is is like your live ops once you're live is that something that you plan out before you go live is it something that you sort of plan on the fly when you are live like what does that look like for maybe angry birds or other experiences you've worked on yeah, I think you have to have a good, pretty good sense of what possible updates could be. And I think, you know, most of the developers who are listening to this will probably already have a, a good idea about for each genre, what live operations usually looks like and what kind of features they want to, uh, you know, release over time. And those, especially the first few updates, I think is important to kind of have in your back pocket going into launch, but then coming uh, beyond that, definitely, as Guy said, just coordinating with the IP holder on a regular basis. Some will be more interested in, than others in having regular communication, but, um, you know, talking to them about what your plans are. Okay. Well, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Was there ever a time where you had certain expectations for the kinds of updates you were going to do pre-launch that maybe you adjusted on the fly? Like, do you have an example that you could think of for that? Uh, throughout gaming, uh, many, 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 many examples, uh, you know, reaching back to the mobile days when we were working on empire builders, which were very economy driven, the economy uh, could end up being skewed in a certain way overnight. And, uh, you know, you might have to totally change how certain characters are powered or, uh, you know, how different troops perform and sort of, uh, you know, against each other or people are buying too many of a high level uh, character, for example. And you might have to sort of change what your live off strategy is for the coming week. So um, I don't know if I have a specific example from Nerf or, or Angry Birds, but uh, def definitely, you know, as you all, all know that in, in your uh, weekly planning, um, the community and, and the game will throw curveballs at you for sure. Yeah, all the time. Okay, well, we're kind of wrapping up here and maybe I wanted to throw out like one or two more questions, Ben, starting for you, you know, you've had so much experience with these partnerships in the past. Ultimately, how do you define success for a project? How do you define it? Like for your team, for the brand, like where, where do you begin and end with that? Yeah. I, you know, I think it partly depends on where in the life cycle of your studio you're at. Um, and it also depends. I think maybe there could be some confusion around. We've been talking about two types of collaborations uh, sort of interchangeably. But just to clarify, there are a couple of things we're discussing here. One is marketing activations for brands where they're paying developers to build something that they think is going to help grow uh, their user base or their, you know, build excitement and awareness around a certain brand, like, uh, you know, I think like what the gang did with, with bands, for example. And then there's uh, another um, version of this that is uh, licensed products where the developer is usually paying for most or part of development of the game. Um, and they're optimizing generally for revenue by leveraging a brand for uh, reduced acquisition costs and for, for awareness. Um, so in, uh, sorry, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> how, how do you define success? Like right. game ships, how do you determine whether it's it's been a, a successful uh, endeavor? Or not? Yeah. Now I see why I set it up like that. Uh, yeah. So for brand partnerships, uh, you know, the, the for the brand, it might be that they just want to get a lot of reach and get uh, good ratings on the experience that they can show that, hey, we reached a lot of potential customers and they really enjoyed the experience and are building affinity for the brand. So they might want to see like, hey, we have 85% plus or 80% plus thumbs up and we got X million numbers of visits, that's great. That could be success for that project. For a licensed project, uh, usually it's, you know, you're looking at, are you, you building revenue and a user base that you can leverage into future projects? But if you're just starting out in brands, it might also just be that you wanna show that you can build a high quality brand experience. And if it's not profitable uh, at the beginning, that could be okay. You know, that could just help you sort of build credibility to get further deals down the line and uh, expand your studio. Mm. I mean, that's an excellent point uh, right there, just to sort of drive home is just what, where are you in the life cycle of, of your um, studio? And early on, it's really just about getting shots on goal. And later on, you know, those, those goals kind of evolve. Yeah. Um, well, we are wrapping up here. I do have 
one final fun question for you all. So I'll, I'll go in order here, but maybe starting with Hawken and Ollie. What is one thing you wish you knew before working with your first partnership? Or if you can't necessarily remember, what's one thing that's been invaluable to learn over the process of working with brands that you really want to get that out there for everyone to, to hear and know? Uh, that's a good question. Since we had very extensive experience working with IPs and brands before jumping onto Roblox, uh, yeah, we could just... Um, have the advice of being humble and be very communicative with your, uh, with the brands and and your partners. Yeah. Okay, Ali, putting you on the spot next. Uh, yeah, no, I can only agree. And I mean, we said it a couple of times during this call already. But like, make sure that you are aware of lead times and yeah, communication is key. Communication, communication. All right, Ben, over to you. Your one nugget of truth. <laughs> um, I think that if you could find brands that you're excited about working with, it could just be a really rewarding experience to build something out in, a, in an IP that you're already excited about. So it's, uh, you know, it's so much in life is just about finding stuff to do that's going to be fun and rewarding to you along the journey. And uh, that's one of the really fun things about IP to me is just working with with brands that I like and that I'm excited to work on. And that kind of get, keeps you going every day and you get to take more shots on goal without feeling burnt out. Yeah, well said. All right, Guy, pressure's on. One piece of advice, <laughs> right. don't mess this All up. Right. <laughs> Mom's spaghetti. Um, no, so just uh, the same the same as uh, everyone said. Um, it's if, if you're not like passionate, about the brand that you're going to work if you don't like see this connection and able to find a player inside you that play that or at least communicate and and you know like have this discussion with the the, the community that is going to play it then um yeah it's 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 a lot of communication and it can become very stressful in those moments when you need to approve a version there's already hundreds of thousands of players playing and this you know, this back and forth email or asset is something that you're going to be sitting around your desk at like eight in the evening. And, and um, so make sure the communication is also in the agreement. It's just going to help both of you love the other side more as you progress and go into this long term rela relationship, uh, but also be passionate about the brand. So like love the game that you're going to make, see yourself connect with it. Okay, so be passionate and seek passionate. to not be adversaries with the person you're trying to partner with. <laughs> Definitely great advice. Yeah. Well, I wanted to... have a good agreement. <laughs> What's that? Be passionate and have a good legal agreement. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. Well, I wanted to thank our three development teams, uh, Toya, the Metaverse team, and the gang for joining us and for all of my questions that you guys were able to answer today. Uh, I want to toss it over to Aaron because I know that our audience has a few more questions for you all. Uh, but Aaron, go ahead and take it away. Hey, thanks everybody. We do have a bunch more questions. So to start it off, how does one avoid making a branded game feel corporate? I mean, we know that Roblox has its own flavor and culture and that's really important. How do you kind of maintain that uh, while also bringing in a brand? It's, it's a game and it's a game on Roblox. So it has to connect with that environment. Like, so even if it's like a, a, a food brand or a drink brand, you can make sure that it's a food fight or it's a, some kind of like a aqua fun thing. So uh, it, it has to connect in, in a way that is 51% Roblox <clears throat> and 40, 49%. Uh, brand. All right. What are the things that a brand tends to value the most when looking for a partnership to make a game on this platform? I think they're looking to see that you have a track record of building high quality experiences. Um, in probably in both cases, both for a marketing experience and for a licensed experience, you know, a big thing for them is just being sure that you're going to be able to ship something that they're going to be proud of and that they uh, feel like matches the quality of the brand. 
uh, on a reasonable timeline. And so if you can help assure uh, them of the professionalism of your team and what you folks have delivered previously, that'll go a long way in, in winning them over. Great, all right. I'm an independent developer and I want to work on branded partnerships. Any advice on how I can convince brands to take a chance on me, even though I don't have a company? I think as a independent developer, maybe it's more about starting in a smaller, smaller way with an isolated product like uh, UGC, for example, on Roblox, maybe establish a relationship first and then you can go over into making um, an entire experience, I would say. I'd also just throw out, this is uh, unsolicited advice based on the question, but just uh, at least in my experience, the best things that you know I've ever worked on in my life have been built with teams. And I think that if you can try and find other like-minded folks that you trust working with, um, together you'll be able to go further than, than any individual contributor can. Uh, so of course, build what I think Ula's advice was fantastic for starting out and then over time trying to build a team of, of other folks you can work with will be really powerful too. Awesome. Regarding the business model with brands, do you usually get paid for developing the project and that's it? Or do you have some variable regarding the audience, rev share, something similar? What are the different ways that you can you know, structure that deal? I think it's something that you can, you can talk like open, openly with the brand once you start getting into the conversations. Cause um, for example, if a brand is like, you know, worldwide giant, uh, really large, then rev share might not be possible but then um, they can definitely help with any cost that you might have for this project. Um, so, but then again, like if it's a smaller brand, then maybe, you know, the balance shifts. So it's really about having like this discussion with the brand and, and understanding what works best for both sides. Great, thank you for that. All right, here's another one. What would be better for a brand developing their own group for the experience? or to rely on the developers group if it has a community already built up? Great question. Uh, I would say it depends once again, it's about the brand and, and, um, uh, and what they want to do and, and what, what suits them the best. I mean, of course, uh, you can get a lot of initial traction uh, uh, releasing uh, a game in a group that's not uh, the, the brand's group, which has a lot of followers. Uh, but uh, in most cases, the brand's IPs, um, publishers, they want to own that player base. So they will probably want to have the control over that play player base by themselves. Um, so yeah, they're, they're, I would say in the end, it's uh, usually up to the, to the brand, how they want to do it. But uh, yeah, there is a, there, there is also a, the upkeep of um, community management, etc. And depending on what brand that is, uh, some brands can can uh, handle that by themselves. Other brands won't help with that. So. That makes a lot of sense. All right. Uh, how do you know if a brand will appeal to a particular audience? Does the brand provide their own data, and should you do some of your own research as well? Yeah, I would say you want to do some of your own research. Um, the brand can provide their own demographic information, which sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. Um, you may know, especially if you're closer to the age range of your target players, you may have a good sense of what's really popular with uh, the group. Uh, I think on this call, the, <laughs> there's a little bit more of a discrepancy between the average Roblox user and the age of uh, the developers here. So for us, it's more relying on data and trying to understand uh, you know, what is most popular with the demographic that's on Roblox. And there are tools out there that you can look into for reporting on awareness and affinity. All right, last question. How important is it to be personally interested in the IP that you are working with? Should you make an effort to develop an appreciation for it in order to better identify with its fans? Um, yeah, I, I, the first thing I did uh, on the Vance project was to buy a skateboard so i i mean and i think that was good just for it, it gives you a sense of like investment into it 
So absolutely, yeah, I think you should be passionate about a brand. Yeah, for um, for two months, our every lunch at the office was watching two episodes of Miraculous Ladybug. So yes, definitely. <laughs> Not exactly the core audience for that one. We were just like singing the the theme song, like when we were just humming it when we were like walking past each other. <laughs> yeah, just to to pile on with that one too. I think uh, especially for deep franchises, like when we started working on The Hobbit, for example, we went back and reread all the Lord of the Rings books and The Hobbit, and uh, there's that other crazy one that he wrote that's like the Bible of the Hobbit world, the Similarion or something like that. And all that lore is really important because if you're going after users who are super steeped in the brand and in the intellectual property, if you build something that doesn't feel authentic to them, that can be a real turnoff. And then you've sort of squandered your opportunity with the core uh, evangelists of the, the fans of that brand too. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very good point that you are like on the brand project, you're always going to be it might be a wider audience or a smaller, but you're always in some sense going to dive into like a niche audience. So it's very good to be really knowledgeable about the brand. I've got my own question kind of to tie into that. So you have super fans and then you have casual fans and how, how do you like appeal to both? It's important to try to appeal to both. What do you think? Um, yeah, I, I mean, on Roblox, it's always good to try to get as a widespread as you possibly can. But it also ties in to the other questions that we've answered about, like, the game has to make sense, because if they are not that invested the, in the brand, you might have to push more on the game side. Like Guy said, maybe do 51% uh, Roblox and 49% brand. All right, well, that is all of our questions. So thank you all so much for attending, asking all those great questions. Of course, I wanna thank Guy and Ben and Ollie and Hawken, as well as Dan for this awesome roundtable conversation and Missimo and Dino S'more for their support of the event as well. For everyone watching on YouTube, thank you for tuning in. Drop your questions and comments below. We would love to hear from you. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the Roblox Developer Relations YouTube channel. More level videos are coming soon.